So welcome to this uh, special final colloquium of the year and thanks uh, Kate for uh, preserving it for you here. So I'm very happy and proud to present the students of the Quantitative Research Methods course I at 802 um, with their presentation. So over the course of the semester they went through the whole idea of what research is and what statistics is and research methods and scientific method and all these kind of things and ran their own project that they are going to present here today. Um, I gave them a very strict limit of you have to present in uh, seven minutes or less. Uh, so they all will have a, a little timer here uh, that uh, goes off if you guys go over time. You can see it here. Um, we, so we have nine presentations. The order, in case you don't remember, we start with Alejandro. So basically everybody watch out who's in front of you. So in the order is Alejandro, Alex, Jan Yu, William, Jason, Lu Luciano, Shrileka, Quench, uh, and Arefin, and I'll have a few final words in the end. Um, so uh, we should still be able to make it in time, I think, if everybody stays in time. So um, when one person is ready, uh, the next person, while we are doing questions, just come up and get ready so we don't lose a lot of time in between. Uh, final words, so we will be uh, recording uh, your presentation. If you really, 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 really don't want it to be recorded, we can delete it later, uh, so just let us know. And this is also why we need to use these microphones, so put it somewhere here close enough uh, and somewhere where uh, you don't touch it all the time because otherwise the sound will be completely off. All right, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Alejandro. Thank you. Hello. Know when you're ready and start the timer. All right, uh, I'm ready. Well, hi everyone, my name is Alejandro Van Zant Escobar. I'm working with Tekla Shiphorst in the Moving Stories project. And um, for Bernard's class, I was working on a project on comparing the validity of expert and novice movement observation using Laban movement analysis. So Laban movement analysis is a qualitative tool for um, articulating, studying, analyzing movement. and um, Essentially, this, this smaller study takes place in the context of a greater study on the reliability of LMA, Laban Movement Analysis, specifically looking at inter-rater agreement. So it's a tool for describing movement according to various categories, and um, it's a qualitative tool. So it's the, the, the goal is to articulate movement with very precise terms, and, but it's, um, it's, it's something that's built out, out of expertise. We're not measuring it with, with um, computers. We're not using physical measurements, but instead there's people who are called CMAs, Certified Movement Anal Analysts, who are trained over several years to analyze movement using LMA. So therefore, even though it's very well respected within the field of dance and somatic movement practices, um, we're interested in seeing, kind of applying quantitative methods to evaluate how this qualitative method of measurement works. And specifically, we're interested in uh, validating it as a research methodology. So it's starting to be used quite a bit in HCI, for example to sort of study how people's bodies interact with machines, et cetera. So that's mainly the motivation. Um, so what we're looking at specifically was com in, in this project was comparing the um, performance of novice observers with certified movement analysts in movement observation. So our, we have two hypotheses. First, that there is um, Interrate, higher interrater agreement between CMAs than between novice observers, so that it's more reliable between CMAs. And furthermore, that um, there's, there's greater validity in between expert um, analysts and novice observers. Secondly, as I mentioned, there are four, move, there are four categories of Laban movement analysis, shape, effort, space, and phrasing. And we're interested, we're interested in seeing how uh, novice observers might treat these categories differently to see if some categories are more intuitive than others. So already talking about the motivation. So the experimental procedure is essentially a mixed design. We have uh, two populations um, separated by two uh, groups of um, LMA expertise. We have certified movement analysts and novices. And then they're going to be annotating movement sequences that are separated into different Laban movement analysis categories, which are body, effort, space, and shape. And then we're going to be checking the validity of the annotation as our dependent variable. So we have 24 participants, 12 of them being novices and 12 of them being experts. And then what we have is a movement database that was curated by a certified movement analyst. 
So this CMA essentially worked with an actor to record a series of three to five second movement sequences where they asked them to first perform an action such as knocking or giving directions in a neutral way and then asked them to perform the same um, action with a variation according to some LMA category. So this is what we're taking as sort of the ground truth, the labels that were given when this movement database was created. So it's essentially a sequence of videos of, that look like this, someone performing actions. And then what we had was that each subject annotated 22 videos, so the, all these videos in the database, with six of them being videos in, with variations in the shape category, six in the space category, seven in effort, and three in phrasing. And they were also allowed two annotations per video to, so to give them a greater, greater breadth of seeing if they actually agree with the original labels. So that means that first they were asked if they observed a change in the video they're annotating. Secondly, they were asked to provide an annotation if they saw a change. And then third, they were allowed to provide a second annotation in case they saw a change. And that was used in computing the validity because essentially what, when we were comparing their results with the original labels, we, their first, if their first annotation precisely matched the label given, then that was uh, 100% perfect score, and if that didn't match, if their second label matched, then that was a 50% score. Um, so we only, recent, we only yesterday finished collecting the data, so we haven't yet run the analysis, but essentially we'll be running a mixed design ANOVA to see if the, L, uh, the effect of LMA categories is significant, so to see if there's different um, validity ratings between body effort, space, and shape, and also if the effect of expertise is significant. And then in the context of the greater study, we're also going to be looking at inter-rater agreement or reliability using a Cohen's CAP coefficient where we'll be calculating um, across the whole, each, across each group, so across the group of novices and across the group of experts, um, to what extent they agree with each other because that is this, sort of the main goal of the greater study. So those results are to come and uh, they'll be in the paper, unfortunately not yet ready to present. So thanks. So do you have any questions? Great. So we have a bit of time for questions, apparently. Uh, uh, in this kind of presentation. So what are you going to have? Are there uh, other studies of uh, Hunter uh, in the same field? Yeah, there are. Yeah, there have been some studies of. Um, sorry, go ahead. There are, some, there are essentially two main studies that were carried out, one which was in the 70s that was specifically focusing on the effort category of lab and movement analysis, and they found that it did have a high reliability rating. So this was carried, carried out by the Laban Institute for Movement Studies. So the results were very positive, but we wanted, were interested in looking beyond just the effort category, so effort, body, uh, effort space, shape, and phrasing. And then there was also a recent study that uh, also had positive results about reliability within LMA, but it was looking at a specific sort of derivation from LMA, a specific system um, for used for like creative therapy. So it was, their results were interesting, but still um, not, sp not looking at the core LMA system. Yeah. Uh, well, no, the reliability would be between the group. The reliability doesn't, if we're just looking at one user, like, we can't really talk about reliability. Like, the, I guess, inter-rater um, agreement is basically synonymous with reliability. So what we're testing, that's sort of the difference between testing validity and reliability. So when we're testing validity, we have a label that we're taking as ground truth, and then we're seeing if this person annotated it with the same label. And if they did, then it's valid, and if they didn't, then it's invalid. And then for reliability, we're not uh, looking at the ground truth, but we're saying here, these 12 people all annotated the same thing. To what extent do they agree with each other? And if the agreement's very high, then we would conclude that it's a, a reliable system. Yeah. All right. Thank the speaker again. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, here you go. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone for coming out on the last colloquium presentation.
So in the real world, we can easily navigate and know where we are. If I were to ask you to close your eyes and point towards the door by the staircase, you could easily point over there. And even if I turned you around 180 degrees, you could still easily point to where it is. In virtual environments, however, it's not so simple. People get easily lost and disoriented. If you've ever played any video games, you notice that they use compasses or maps, typically, so that you don't get lost in these worlds. And we want to know, why is that? And can we make things any better? So what we wanted to look at is to see if really small movements and rotations can help trigger your orientation sense because there's often a mismatch between your vestibular system, which tells you where you are in space, and your body, because you're sitting still. So we wanted to look at, does self-perceived motion relate to how well people perform in these pointing tasks? And what is a pointing task? Well, moving around a virtual environment and then pointing to different objects. So if I were in a virtual environment in this classroom, point to the door, you would point over there using a joystick. And we also wanted to look at the individual differences. So does your spatial navigation ability, something that's innate or trained, correlate uh, with your spatial cognition task? And we'll look at mental rotation ability, your sense of direction, more on that in a bit, your real world navigational ability, any 3D gaming experience, so people who are playing these 3D games a lot, does that help? and movement experience. So are these people like dancers or doing yoga? Does that help in orienting in virtual environments too? So the apparatus was this virtual environment and it's a maze. Those are the hedges, those green things. And you were asked to follow this red sphere around this maze. There were two conditions. One was with a joystick and one was with physical rotations. So you can see the joystick rotation. You're moving around just with the joystick. And in the physical rotations condition, you're actually turning your whole body. It's gaze directed so that you're moving with your body as well. In our real world task, we did something similar to the maze experiment. We went around the hallways in Seat, so you might have seen me with this blue dial box. And participants were asked to point to these different objects on the sticky note, and that they were like a spiral or a triangle. And they were asked to remember those locations and also get a distance estimate. We designed it to have four groups with 10 people in them. It was with within subjects design and counterbalance. These were the four conditions. So if you were in the first group, there is this maze configuration. So there are two different mazes so that there wasn't a learning effect for the maze. And they were in the joystick with the first condition, and then the physical rotations with the second version. If you were in group two, you had the same order of mazes, but different order of conditions. And then same with three and four. So participants did one of the virtual maze conditions, either one or two first, with the joystick or the physical rotations. Then we gave them a short break and gave them the Santa Barbara sense of direction scale. And you can see it's a questionnaire with a Likert scale. And this was so that they didn't get too motion sick. And then we did the second virtual maze condition, followed by a post maze questionnaire, just asking about their movement experience and 3D gaming experience. Then we did the real world environment, followed by a mental rotation task, where you have to match this one to two others. And finally, a post-experiment interview. Some results. While we're still in the midst of running this experiment, I only have six participants. And this is for one of the maze conditions and pointing to the different objects in the maze. So they were everyday objects, like a 
a bag, books, a car, a cat, things like that. And this is their distance estimation. So you can see for this chair, I'm seeing there's a big variation for this one participant. So that's something to look into. Maybe they're not very good at estimating where they are, or that's where they got lost. The next steps will continue running participants, hopefully get up to 40, and analyze the pointing data. So we'll look at pointing accuracy. So when they went through the maze, they had to use the joystick to point two different things. So we'll measure the actual distance or the pointing estimation against theirs using some circular statistics. And we'll also look at correlating their navigational abilities to how well they did in that pointing task. Thank you. The whole experiment was an hour. Yeah. yeah, participants, if they were in school, then they got course credit. And then we also looked at Craigslist, so they got $15. What would you do differently if you would run the experiment again? If I run the experiment again, I would want to add one component and ask them to actually draw the map, what they thought they went. Because then I could maybe see, you know, if they're super off, maybe they created a different kind of mental cognitive map. That might be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we basically asked them on a questionnaire how many hours a week they play video games or 3D games, and then also just ask them what kinds of activities they've done and how frequent they do them and if they've done them like in the past or if they're currently active. Thank the speaker again. Yeah. Just to start the presentation, and then I'll give you your notes here. And So hi everyone, I'm Jen Yu. I'm uh, working with Philippe, working on sound and computation. So the name of my study is the ground truthing and validating the soundscape balance arousal classification with multiple users. So our study can help soundscape composers by giving them a tool to classi classify the soundscapes based on the effective rating. So for soundscape composers, they usually use a selected sound from a few recordings and use some sound synthesis techniques to create electronic acoustic music. So if they have the sound categories by their emotion tags, so it's better for them to create emotional sound compositions. The previous study used the 250 field recordings for free sounds uh, database and used four audio features and the stepwise so multiple linear regression model to do the prediction. And their result, the R square represents uh, like the how much percentage of the data can be explained by this linear regression model. So it shows that like they have 71.2 percent of the data that can uh, represent by linear regression model that predicting balance, and around 71 percent that can predicting the arousal, which is promising. However, the pre previous study just to be tested on one expert user. So we're hoping to test on multiple users to see if the uh, system is stable enough. So 
uh, we, we're hoping to validate the system with multiple people's data. By validating, I mean when we feed the more people's data into the system, it will still work smoothly and successfully. And we're ho uh, our hypothesis is that uh, the predicting arousal is a little bit much easier than predicting balance. So I'll talk about this expect in our in our study, just a complex model of effect, our data set, uh, audio features and machine learning models, and par par participants, online study, and uh, uh, analysis of the result. So this is the uh, two-dimensional effect grade model, which is proposed by Russell in 1980s. So we have two two axis sets. The axis axis represent the balance. On the right axis, uh, right side of the axis is pleasant. Left side is unpleasant. And the y-axis represents the uh, arousal, and the top means uh, eventful, the, the bottom means uneventful. So we use the, our data set is from a sound idea corpus and world soundscape corpus. And we categorize sound into six categories based on Maurice, previous uh, study from Maurice Schaefer, uh, which are uh, natural sound, human sound, sound and society, uh, mechanical sounds, quiet and silence, and sounds like indicators. So the features we use are four common features from a music cognition study of total loudness, perceptual spreads, perceptual sharpness, MFCCs, and we use the stepwise multicollinear regression model. So we have 22 participants from SFU, and for each participant, we we'll give them 120 audio clips uh, to let them to input their arousal and balance data for each clip. And this is the interface of our online study. Uh, for each user, they can just input their, uh, uh, have a input a dot on this canvas so we can record their arousal balance data for each specific audio clip. And this is a result of the model that uh, uh, predicting arousal. So the R square is the question to determine which represent the how much percentage of the data can be explained by our model. So we can see. Uh, like the, for example, for the participant one, so 32% of the, his data can be explained by our model for predicting arousal. And the F study tells us uh, like the like significant linear regression relationship between the prediction value of our predictors, and uh, the the model gives us specific features like for each specific model. So this is the figure tells overall we analyzed 12, 12, uh, 12 participants' data. And this will tell us overall percentage of data that can be explained by the models. And the left side is the uh, plot for the balance data. And we can see the, uh, for example, for uh, participant one, and we can see that he had around 40% of his data can be explained by the model. And then, like the, we have uh, from overall pictures, we can see that, that there's significantly different between different uh, participants. And this figure shows that. Like the in overall, like the uh, arousal, uh, there's a, a significantly higher result of predicting arousal uh, by comparing to predicting balance. And these uh, in uh, normal PMP plot regression standard residual tell us uh, there's a small deviation from uh, the expected data to the, our uh, observed data, which is good. And our conclusion right now is the system can be valid on multiple users' data, and the arousal can be better predicted compared to balance. And our next step is the how to, to detect, the, like, to analyze the relationship between the soundscape perception and the ethnicity background, and also the relationship between soundscape perception and music background. By doing that, we're going to collect more data so we have enough cat data for each category. And we're going to do the uh, inner uh, reliability uh, uh, analysis on those data. Thanks. It's a great attempt of timing. Mm. Do you have any questions? Anybody want to try it out? That's actually easy. Did each participant go through 120 sound clips? Yeah. How long did that take? Uh, six seconds for each. Okay. So around 20, 25 minutes. What kind of sound clips are you using? So we're using a sound clip like like uh, this like categories I mentioned like the uh, like the sound natural sound they're recorded from like field recording from these different places and then categorize those like the human voice and the sound like car sound something like that yeah. Just a, a wider variety. Of yeah yeah yeah. Come on. 
bunch of presentation, but you can okay, answer the sure. questions. Sure. So no, you can okay, just switch to yourself. All right, any further questions? Yeah, so how about what do you hope to do with this in the long term? Like what would you be your vision if this would become your thesis? Uh, right now, this, uh, this, uh, we're just in the uh, start of this uh, research, so we're hoping to collect, maybe now it's the, present, the study is online, so we're hoping to collect hundreds of people's data. So we have enough data for each category on people from different like, ethnic background. So we can see the like, people from different places or uh, culturally and uh, like the, where their birthplace can actually uh, influence their uh, static judgment towards different soundscapes. And also, like, does people have different music background? We'll have different kind of attack like, judgment on, on different soundscapes. So what's yeah. your prediction there in terms of different backgrounds or different what? music background? Yeah, I think the different music background probably won't be an issue to like influence the result. But I think the ethnic background will be some important like, factor. How, how do you think it could affect the results? Because uh, I think for people from uh, like uh, Africa uh, in a village and. Like people from uh, like New York, they probably have different feeling about one specific sound. Probably like if they hear about our sound every day, all, all the time, and they're going to be different. Like, so like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? The age? Yeah, actually, we, we let the users input the age, but I, I don't think that will be a really important issue. As long as all the participants are over 18 or they're like, uh, like yeah, they're not just like kids or something. Yeah, I'm just wondering because like, people our age are going to a lot of different music and older people. I see. Right. Thanks for pulling that out. Yeah, thanks. All right. All right thanks, speaker. Thanks. of motion capture data labeled in a recorded movement. Let me put the microphone a bit higher. Just just put it on the recorder here. Oh, is that too close though? No, that's fine. Okay, so uh, I'm William, and my study is the validation of motion capture data um, labels in recorded movement. So a little bit about what this study actually is. Uh, so what we have is a database of motion capture or mocap data, and we have those data labeled according to the valence arousal model, which is the same as the one presented in the last presentation. And specifically for my study, I want to determine whether human participants would classify these movements as the same label given an identical model of, of, of effect. <clears throat> so the motivation for this is that um, we want to ensure that the actor's perception is, uh, agreed, uh, is in accordance with the perception of other human participants. And this is so that we can use these labels in the future for machine learning models for movement generation and classification. So this is the effect rate that's presented to the participants. So it's similar to the one shown in the last presentation, um, where the x-axis is the measure for valence, and it's a measure of emotion, so from sad to happy. And the y-axis is a measure of energy, so from tired to aroused. And then in between is the various combinations of both. <clears throat> So the methods, we have 42 video clips. They're ranging from about 10 seconds to 25 seconds each. And there's two actors, one male and one female. And then we're using three different types of movements, the eight walk, sharp walk, and free improv. So the eight walk is where the actor would walk in a figure eight pattern. And the sharp walk is where the actor would walk in a straight line, but with sharp turns. And then the free improv is where the actor would uh, would do a certain motion, just whatever motion they want, as long as, it, uh, as long as it fits the label or the prompt given to them. And then our participants are 17 undergraduate students. Um, and they watch these videos, and then they rate both the valence and arousal. And our rating scale ranges from negative 1 to 1. So from the effect rate, uh, from the left side, it's negative 1 to 1. 
And then we conducted a t-test to compare the mean participant responses with the labels. Uh, so the video, okay, so the video does not show up, but I had a sample video in here. Um, it's probably in the folder of doing that. Uh, should I look for it? <laughs> This clip down here on the folder there. Uh, yep. Uh, no, it's not in there. Yeah, it's not in here. Yeah. Okay. Just keep going. Okay. Um, and then this is the interface that the students will use. So as an example, the white dot is where the student indicate their response to that particular video. So for in this particular case, this, resp this response would mean that the student thought um, <clears throat> that arousal was somewhat neutral or close to neutral, whereas the valence is closer to the sad and unhappy side. Uh, so some of the results. So for all these plots, the, the, the left plot will be uh, valence and then the right will be arousal. The y-axis is the mean uh, participant responses. So this is valence, arousal, and then the x-axis is just um, the category of videos, so low, neutral, high, the labels. So as you can see in almost all of these, uh, there is a trend that goes from low to high, so from low, uh, the low label videos to the high. Um, so in a nutshell, the participants do, uh, are consistent in that they agree which ones are the low and which ones are the high for both valence and arousal. However, almost all the neutral and high arousal, uh, valence and arousal movements are perceived to be lower than the labels actually are. Um, but the, and also the responses to the low, uh, low valence and arousal videos are the most consistent with the labels. So in conclusion, um, <clears throat> so something else interesting was that the participant responses were more consistent with labels regarding arousal than valence. And I thought this could be due to the fact that the, um, <clears throat> the video shown to them is a mocap skeletal data in which they can't see the facial expression, which could make it harder for participants to assess emotion than um, arousal. And also, in the free, for the free improv, it was uh, a little less controlled in that the actors are able to do whatever movement they wanted. Um, and so the purpose of these movements are not always clear, especially because, again, the lack of facial expressions. Um, and lastly, this, these results leads, uh, or suggest that the features of valence and arousal in movements are more recognizable, especially when given just the skeletal, skeletal data. And for future uh, directions, um, we are actually planning on running this with even more part participants to get a better sense of whether these results are accurate. And we also want to include videos of generated movement in there to see if the participants' rating on rec recorded movement agree with the generated movement. Thank you. Yeah. Are the videos on the motion capture skeleton, or are they actually the, like a normal It's the skeleton, so it's a, it's a stick figure. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't show up. But it's just, uh, yeah, you can't determine from just the video whether the actor is male or female, and like what, what any of their facial expressions or what they're wearing, like none of that, so. Do you know that uh, the subjects, well, that's an arousal um, situation, has any effect on duration? Yeah, so I, I don't know whether that has an effect. That could be interesting because uh, given that the study is conducted near the end of the term, like exam stress, whether that would have an effect on people thinking, you know, everything was lower than it actually is. So it, it would be interesting to conduct the study again at uh, maybe the beginning of a term or during the holidays. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so if not, 
then let's thank the speaker again. And <laughs> So next up we have Jason on video feedback for hockey, investigating the effect on shot training. All good. Okay. Uh, so I was interested in finding out if video feedback can help hockey players improve their their shot during self-guided practice sessions. Uh, so. Players in team sports like hockey often rely on coaches to give them feedback throughout their training sessions. Uh, but they also spend quite a lot of time training independently where they don't have that other person to give them feedback. <coughs> uh, so there has been, or actually in, in HCI in general, there's been a lot of work on video, uh, but mostly in the workplace as a collaboration tool or understanding it in the home as a family communication tool. And there's actually relatively little work on video in sports as a tool for training. Uh, and the amount of work, or the work that does exist there is focused a lot on usability of video systems rather than the actual benefit they pose for athletes. Uh, so that's sort of what I'm trying to understand here is can we quantify the, and find some kind of measurable benefit for athletes in training with video tools. Um, so my approach to this experiment was to recruit intermediate amateur hockey players uh, for controlled practice sessions uh, and then to split them into two groups, one that would receive video feedback and one that wouldn't and then to measure their wrist shot velocity and accuracy throughout the sessions, and finally to compare their improvement from start to finish between the two groups. Uh, so what I expected to see was that players who had video feedback would show improvement sooner than those who didn't, and that those who had video feedback would actually make greater gains than those who didn't. And, oh, sorry, and I expected the, those results because I, I imagine that the video feedback would allow you to sort of understand your body movements better and be able to get a like, better idea of what you're doing and correct that technique as you go instead of just purely relying on sort of your own kinesthetic experience. Um, I'll go into more detail on the method here. So, uh, so far I've recruited 10, 10 participants um, and sort of the key criteria is that they identify as intermediates. Uh, the logic behind that being that don't want people who are so new to the sport that they, they're not sort of skilled enough to practice on their own. And we're also not really interested in working with really polished professional type people who are so well practiced that they don't really have any room for improvement. Uh, the setup involved a, a shooting pad with pucks, uh, a target, a radar display that tracked the speed of the shots, and uh, a tablet for the video group. Uh, so this is an example. This is the space I used to pilot this actually in my backyard. Um, I actually didn't end up setting up tarps everywhere I did this because it takes a long time. Uh, but this is the kind of space you'd have where you can fire pucks away at that net there um, with the, the radar display tracking your speed. Um, oh, I'm missing a slide here. Oh well, so you don't get to see what the video feedback looks like now. Um, so the procedure for it was uh, in each session the, the participant would shoot 15 times which takes about a minute or two. And they'd have a three minute rest period and then they'd shoot again and they'd do that four times. Uh, and so throughout each of those sets we're recording the velocity of the shot and we're approximating accuracy by recording how many targets hit against the total number of shots taken. And uh, the video group would have access to a video recording of their last shooting session in each of the rest periods. So they'd be able to scrub back and forth on a tablet a video of them shooting and see each shot they took and how their form looked while they were doing it. Um, so the limitations to this, uh, I think the most important one is that maybe it's d it could be quite difficult to measure or to show improvement in a single session, uh, but given the, the scope of the class project and everything like that, we were only able to run each participant through in a single session. Um, and secondly, improving accuracy and velocity at the same time are possibly conflicting goals, so it might have been a, a mistake to try and do both of those at the same time. Uh, and then there were some more lower level ones. Obviously, we'd love more participants, and fatigue could be a confound, but we tried to balance that out with the rest periods. Um, so now for the results, what did we find? Uh, so this is a line plot showing accuracy by group across the four shot sets um, with 95% confidence intervals. And I think the takeaway from this display is that the confidence intervals are enormous. And so with the current number of participants, I don't think we can say very much about the accuracy. So our analysis here is focused on the, the velocity improvements. So this is a line plot showing the velocity by group across the four shot sets. And what you should notice here is that they're actually remarkably similar and consistent across the four sets in both groups. So we ran a mixed ANOVA 
uh, to see if any of these differences were slight differences were significant. And uh, all of the assumptions were met except for the, the assumption of homogeneity. Uh, but given the low number of participants, I decided to just go on and report the results anyway. Uh, with a higher number, we'd have a better idea of how much power that test would have. Um, so the results of the ANOVA, the between subjects effect, so whether there was a significant difference between the video condition and the no video condition, uh, it, there was no significant difference. And then as far as the within subjects effect goes, again, we didn't see any significant differences between the different sets of shots. Uh, so in plain terms, what that tells us is that the results did not support either hypothesis. Uh, and they suggest that video feedback did not have a sig significant effect on the participant shot velocity. Um, but at the same time, um, I think we noticed the, the results indicated that there was no significant differences between the shot sets in general. So there was no real improvement in these single sessions that we ran. Uh, and what I think that means is that what we need to do next is repeat the study with obviously more participants, but also over a longer period of time. So say uh, one session a week for several weeks or even multiple sessions a week to really sort of get closer to that um, the way training would work where you're not really expecting to see improvement in a single day. It's more something that happens over the course of like months or even years. Um, alternatively, another direction we could go would be to iterate on the design of the video feedback. So I mentioned that we're just using a simple like tablet setup and then really basic software. Maybe there's a way we could you know, make that design a little bit more complicated or a little bit smarter to give you feedback in a way that's going to let you actually improve faster. Uh, so thanks for listening. I'll take questions now if anyone has them. Yep. So you mentioned that the peak was the compound, but then when you showed that there was no significant difference between the sets of shots, would that suggest that the peak was not? Yeah, maybe, maybe it wasn't uh, a huge deal. Um, yeah. It's, it's also possible, I mean, I think I'd still consider fatigue a compound. Yeah, I would expect that um, you'd show some slight improvement just by kind of getting into it and getting warmed up. Uh, so maybe that kind of, my understanding of it, my guess would be that the little bit of improvement you would have shown in your practice session would kind of cancel out with fatigue. Um, yeah, but you're right, it was kind of interesting. Uh, any other questions? No, I'll pass this off to you. And are you present? Yeah, it should be. Uh, everything Bernard gave me is in here, so uh, just make sure you use the ones at the bottom. The ones at the top are just like system files. Uh, oh, I need the microphone. Yeah, this is open. Here you go. And then. This is one where I'm typing, typing all the time, I'm just typing directly. Presenter's note. Hmm? It should be right there, right? No. Oh, it's there. Thanks. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My, my name is Luciano Frizera. I'm a first year uh, student at PhD at CIET. I'm here today to talk about my experiment on effectiveness and efficiency of time representation on the human spatial movement map visualization. Uh, we are always in movement as we come and go from home to school, to shopping malls, uh, to work. Uh, we walk, we drive, we take public transportation, we run to do a number of activities. And uh, all this movement, uh, at first glance, look sometimes chaotic. This is a video of not playing. Uh, this is a 24 hours of public transportation in London. Uh, as you can see, it's a little bit complicated to understand what's going on there. But movement is transitory and uh, some, sometimes it just leave traces behind, just like uh, marks on the sand and trails on the snow. So if we if we we'll be able to follow these trails, we might have uh, um, a way to understand our interactions with space and with other people. Uh, new technologies such as mobile phones are, are giving us uh, new opportunities to track our own data, 
Uh, I'm sure that many of you have been using Google Maps to uh, track your own uh, um, your own movements and uh, explore the space and plan routes in the city. And if you do, be aware that it's not only you. Google is following you as well. So this is me in the last week, going from back and forth from home and and, and SFU. Um, so. Human spatial movement is a multidimensional data. It's not, it's not only about spatial uh, uh, information, uh, latitude and, and longitude, but all derived information with uh, spatial data, like altitude, the distance, uh, the direction of the movement. Uh, and add to that, like time, movement is always like across time and space. So there is a start and uh, an end time that we, we, we do in, in, in movement. And all, again, all derived information with that, like duration and speed and velocity. And add on top of that, whatever features that you can, you can put in your movement, like mode of transportation, type of activity, with whom you are, and uh, the motivation of that, uh, of that movement. So it's important to work with geocontextual information to understand uh, the motivations of the movement and why, why we're moving from one place to another. But, but how we can make sense of this amount of data? It's complicated. So I think the best way is through visualizations. And we are, uh, with movement and, and spatial, uh, spatial data, we are doing a lot of maps and timelines. So this is Andrianko and Andrianko maps uh, used, uh, showing traffic information in Milan. So as you can note, it's a, um, a lot of uh, issues with uh, traffic jam in the weekdays. Uh, another example is Zhao demonstrating the importance of contextual data in the interpretation of movement. This is a survey uh, they collected in 1971, and they are trying to understand what people are doing in the city, where they're coming and going. And the third example is Zhang making intense use of uh, timelines to show where people spend their time in Tali and Estonia. As you can see, it's, it's a bit confusing, it's complicated, it's too too many data at the same time. So how, how can we prove that? How can we use colors uh, and uh, visual elements to, to uh, deliver the right message to us? So I step back with all this multidimensional data and I focus on analyzing uh, what, uh, how, how we could uh, encode uh, duration and roots in a map. Uh, Dong in 2012 did an experiment to test optimal number of colors and light thickness in dynamic traffic maps. In my experiment, uh, I am applying colors and light thickness as time scale of a path travel by a single person in one day. So my question is really, which technique is more effective and which one is more efficient? By efficient, I mean like how quick we can uh, uh, realize and understand the information on the screen. And effectiveness is uh, the, the, like how we get the right information. Um, so I put together a survey where people, where participants are asked questions about uh, time and space, duration and distance. They use a Vancouver downtown map encoded with colors, line thickness, and uh, both techniques together. And I'm asking questions like, which section of the path is shorter? Which one is longer? Uh, how long does it take from goes to one place to another? Uh, in the, in the uh, design literature, uh, colors doesn't have any uh, inherent sequence or order. So it's kind of weird when we assign colors to, to scale value. So my hypothesis is that line scale will be better to represent uh, duration in, in the map. However, colors have been used in traffic maps for a long time, like traffic lights and density maps. So I'm not sure how people would respond to that. That's why I'm doing the experiment. Unfortunately, I don't have the results yet. Uh, I'm still collecting the data. But I can share a very interesting outcome uh, as my, my participants are coming. In the end of the, the survey, I asked their preferences, if they, if they prefer colors or line thickness. And up to now, 83% prefer colors. I'm not sure why, uh, and I'm very excited to, uh, to analyze the data and see if the preference matches with the performance in analyzing the information. 
Uh, so to conclude, um, I want I want to like the result of my my research wants to um, improve the way we design map visualization. Uh, I want to help analysts and really regular people like us to make sense and have new insights about uh, human spatial movement. It could also be valuable to create, like to understand the, uh, uh, people's behaviors and needs and then create public policies like new bike lanes and uh, investments in public transportation. Uh, but really what I want to do is engaging people in their own spatial rhetoric in the city. Like, how and where we are going, why we, we, we did that route instead of the other, uh, when we are moving to the city. So if you are interested in the results of this uh, research, please email me and when we get the data I'm willing to share with you. Um, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Basically, so a certain li line thickness you mentioned it's 20 minutes. Does it mean like 20 minutes per centimeter on your map, or how does that? It's it's by segment so of the movement. Yeah. So the segment represents like a, a, a duration of a person move from one point to another. Mm -hmm. So it's a total between the yes. segments, and the segments yeah. are uh, basically indicated by. So how do people know where the segment ends? And uh, well, in this case, I just assign like a, a, a like a, a bubble or a mark. But in real world, I'm, I'm not sure how to mark that. I I wanted to work with uh, personal data, like people understanding their their own data, but it's not possible right now. It's like it's uh, it's very hard to get to. Uh, uh, so basically, your coding or color coding is different than what, for example, Google Maps does. Yes. Uh, when it shows red, it's like you're slow on that part. It's not the Google part. Maps co encode yeah. uh, speed. I'm, I'm so encoding why duration. You do differently? Uh, well, it's a different question. In, in that case, it's uh, speed of the traffic. Mm -hmm. In my case, it's how long do you take from go from one, mm -hmm. one point to another. So in the maps that I'm showing. There is one segment that I, uh, this is all my, my own data, that I walk through West Georgia by foot, and the other I took the bus. So you don't know what, like, it's the same route, but different timing. You don't know the speed, but you could guess the speed by, uh, by calculating the uh, distance and time. All right. <coughs> Thank the speaker again. We have Srilika on okay. association of college research sounds and conflicts. It's, it's very difficult. Hello. Can you hear me? Good. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Srilika. And did you start my talk? Hello everyone, I'm Sri Leka. I'm a student of Dr. Eliza Antel, and I'm here to present my study of association of colors to phonum and graphem pair, that is the English sounds and alphabets. So for this, I need to introduce you to a concept called synesthesia. It is a phenomenon where people experience colors when they hear music or when they hear sounds or when they read a text. It need not be necessarily colors. They can also feel sometimes as to somebody's touching or they can feel some taste. So a form of synesthesia you see in here is called grapham color synesthesia, where people experience color when they read some text. For example, in this synesthesia, like where for this person, the value of uh, 3 would be green, whereas value of 5 would be S, I mean red, and value of S would be red as well. So, yeah, why this, what's the advantage of this phenomenon? It's found that people with synesthesia tend to have more memory power compared to non-synesthetic. For example, if they want to remember a phone number, they can easily color code it and remember. So, and I also want to discuss the difficulty in English. For example, if uh, here English is uh, considered uh, to have like 44 phoneme zones, which is mapped with 26 alphabets. 
and here you can see the sound f takes different spelling for example it's f in frog g h in cough and p h in phone and l f in calf so research says that how can you improve the uh, learning of english by making less spelling mistake so uh, research says that if using color to uh, represent alphabet would actually improve the learning skill on the similar ground there are several research that are done to find the association between the alphabet and the color this gave me a curiosity of why phoneme being an important part in english is not used in this research so i'm asking a question of what is the correlation among participant in selecting a color when you are going to present both alphabet and the sound so my independent variable would be the set of phonemes which has the sounds like ba da ga m and etc and also the graphemes to represent them these phonemes and graphemes are said to have single representation that means uh, they are less likely to be confused among the kids and the dependent variable would be the color they going to pick i i restricted the color to like 11 colors to avoid the noise in the data and my participant would be 33 second generation canadian or an american with english as their first language they are considered to be non synesthetic and non color blind and they volunteer to participate i basically had 10 trials where i presented the both phoneme and graphem and i asked them to pick a color so this is the prototype i developed i asked the participant to think about a color once they listen to the phoneme and graphem then go go to the palette and pick the color so i took in the data which had like 70% consistency for example if a person want to uh, so if a person selected green for g at least for seven times out of 10 trials i considered those data and i performed a chi square and this is the result i got there seemed to be a significant correlation between the colors to phoneme and graphem pairs and these are the colors that are, that are significantly mapped to these letters for example here blue the 80% of the people uh, mapped it to blue for b and for r at least 80% mapped it to red and you can see a lot of colors in here like less than 40% those are like mostly soft colors let's see why they map to it so people said like for example for sound t they felt the sound is really harsh or evil or arrogant that's why they mapped it to a uh, bl- black and whereas they felt the sound m and n that is sounds like m or n is kind of soft peaceful and elegant that's why they went with soft colors and the sound b and d are kind of sharp and so uh, for example here d they felt they mapped it with dirt and they said that it sounded like dirt and dog so they went with brown so uh, okay here is an interesting phenomenon i observed like uh, pe- almost 50% of the people said sound dominated their color selection when compared to letters it's really interesting because like all those previous study just presented the alphabets and uh, asked the participant to map the color whereas in here when when you introduce a third variable called sound it totally changes everything so let's see how it changes this is a study done by simner in 2005 where you can see it, they didn't present the sounds they just presented the alphabets and you can see the difference from our set to their set especially in in areas like m and n you can see a lot of colors mapped to the those uh, alphabets just because you introduce sounds so i consider the limitation of this study would be i restricted the color palette to just 11 colors because i wanted to reduce the noise and yeah i kept all the trials on the same day because i didn't i mean due to the time constraint and also i restricted my population to only those citizens of canada and us because i want to cut out the cultural difference so the main takeaway of the study is of course I, it answered my research question there is a significant correlation in selecting a color to a particular phoneme graphem pair and also the phoneme sound seems to dominate the letter in color selection and it's also an interesting phenomenon to see the emotion in the sounds like how people for different phoneme sounds how they relate to the emotions and they map to the color which i think needs some further studies and okay we got the consistent set like how can we apply this in a learning this would be a f- interesting future study as well yeah. thank you any questions how long was the for, for participant how long did it take it took 
around 10 minutes for 10 trials. So all the letters and sounds, I mean, the way it is presented is totally randomized. So once one trial is completed, I'd go for the second trial. And then I add some post-test questions to be answered where I ask them to self-identify if the f sound or the letter dominated them. How did they say, like, what strategy they used and stuff what like that. What tools did you use to present the sound and the, the colors? Yeah, I developed my own prototype where, like, I got the sounds from a standard phonum website. And I also uh, got the colors from HTML website where, I mean, there's a website called W3HTML which presents these are the color codes for these colors. That's how I got there. Yeah, it can be done, but since considering the participant as non-synesthetic, there is an assumption they won't need a big spectrum of colors. It would also reduce, okay, the colors I presented here are considered to be the colors that are frequently used by humans, by non-synesthetics. So I just went with them because I can have less noise in the data. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Empirical evaluation of a virtual synthesizer automatic calibration system. Yes. Testing. Hello everyone, my name is Kıvanç Tatar. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, my research which is called Empirical Evaluation of a Commercial Synthesizer uh, Automatic Calibration System. So we have a system which uh, replicates a given sound on a synthesizer, on a commercial synthesizer, and I want to understand how well this system performs in terms of human perception. So I will be comparing the system with a user, with a human uh, sound designer, so that uh, I try to find out whether it, it does the task better than the human sound designer. Otherwise, it will be nonsense to use the system to generate a sound. Before going into the details and the experiments, uh, I want to talk about the general context, which is meta-creation or meta-creativity. Meta-creativity is a topic in which we uh, try to figure out how we can use computers to um, help a task of aesthetic creation. In particular, musical meta-creation is uh, a research we try to find out that how we can use computers in the task of generating music. And there are three ways to use computers in musical meta-creation. The first one is the artificially creative musical system. So you make a system, you program a system, and it generates music. You just press the start button and starts, it starts to generate music. You do nothing. Secondly, we have computational uh, models for human musical creativity. So you, you use the computation to um, model the um, music creation, for example, composing or performing. And then thirdly, we have computational system for supporting musical creativity. You want to compose, you want to uh, do a sound design, you want to design a sound, and you want to use computers. How can they help you? So my topic is related with the computational system for supporting musical creativity. So in the system, we tell system that we will give you a sound. Can you show me how to generate that sound on OP1? Let's say that I want to generate an instrument sound. Let's say I want to generate a trumpet sound on the synthesizer. How can I generate it? What's the parameters? System gives us the parameters to generate that sound. So maybe I should mention a couple of uh, terminology that I will be using. When I say target, I will be mentioning the sound that I want to replicate on the synthesizer, like the trumpet sound. When I say replication, I will say that the um, the outcome of the replication of the target sound on the synthesizer. When I say system, I will be mentioning the automatic tuning system that we have. When I say user, I will, uh, mention, I will refer to the human user, which also tries to replicate the same target sounds 
on the OP one. When I say subjects, I will, I will refer to the uh, particip participants of the experiment. So my research question is, can the automatic calibration system outperform a human sound designer on the task of replicating of a given sound with the commercial synthesizer OP1? So the synthesizer is this. It's a, like really small uh, and a great synthesizer. And also, even people uh, produce albums just using that synthesizer. So it's quite useful, quite efficient, and quite new. So uh, I tried to uh, replicate eight sounds on the synthesizer. What are those sounds? The first one would be AK-47. I choose that sound because it's, it has an impulse characteristic. It's very short. The second sound is a bullfrog. It's an animal sound. It's also short. The third sound is a bass guitar. I chose that sound because it has low frequency. It's also short. The fourth sound is chicken clucking. It's also an animal sound. And then I have a um, more complex sound, which is construction. And then I have jill, which is an instrument from Oceania. I have knife sharpener as a complex uh, sound. And then I have trumpet sound. So in my experiment design, my dependent variables are my dependent variable is similarity ratings of subjects in a scale of 10 to 100, in which 0 means uh, 0 to 100, in which 0 means totally dissimilar, and 100 means totally similar. My independent variables are user and system categories. By user, I mean the human sound designer who tries to generate the same sound on OP1. I have eight target sounds. And I have sound attributes, general, pitch, envelope, and timbre. I want to make similarity uh, comparison in terms of gen general, in terms of pitch, envelope, and timbre, because they are different things. One sound can be good at pitch, but one sound can be bad at timbre or envelope. So this is my interface. I, uh, so participants are evaluating one sound at a time, and they don't know whether it is generated by a user or a system, so that they don't have a bias because they might have a bias against the machines. And they are asked to uh, make the rating in terms of four questions, in terms of four sound attributes, which is general, pitch, envelope, and timber. The results. The results say that system did significantly better than the human sound designer, which is me. So there's a significant difference, and it did better than me. And the mean difference is 16. So. Uh, Examining the sound attributes, system did for each sound system did better than me for each sound attribute. However, if we uh, if we investigate each sound, we see that for some sounds, system did same as me, which means that there wasn't any significant difference between me and the system. So what are those sounds? What is the significance of those sounds? Those sounds were AK-47, bass, Jill. So what is the important thing about those sounds? Here is Jill. They all have a short impulse characteristics. So the system was failed. This is the target sound. This is the system replication. This is the human sound designer replication. So you can see that the target has a impulse response in the beginning. The target has a short burst in the beginning, which we call transient response. But system doesn't have that. User has it because we recognize that. Same thing happened in the AK-47-2. And then for the base 2. But for this sound, we have that on at the end of the sound, not in the beginning of the sound, like it. So how can I improve the one minute now? How can I improve the system? Uh, we we can introduce new objectives uh, to the system to handle the transient response of the target signal, which means that we are using a genetic algorithm which is called multi-objective genetic genetic algorithm, uh, and it's specifically called NSGA2, in which we have three objectives. So if we introduce one more objective to handle the transient response, then we can handle this problem. So. Thank you for listening to me. If you have questions, I would, be, I would love to answer them. Any meta creators or synthesizer users? No.
Thanks. All right, then. Uh, yeah. so, yeah. Uh, the system calibrates the OP1, so it gives you the parameters to how to generate that sound on the OP1. Actually, we have the uh, source code of the synthesizer, so we implement it on the computer. So, is the video working on this? Hmm? Is the video and I use the synthesizer, on? basically. I don't I use it. And I record so the video. So, I have a backup without video, and I have a one with video. So, no, no, you should try that. of parallel alternatives in design tasks. Um, it's so like that in the... Why is it losing the view? Do you have it on your own computer? Yeah, I do. Can the I go get it? The rest of it's... Uh, no, it's no, all... It's it's yeah. Okay. You, you, don't your computer? you don't have this phone, most likely. Oh, that's probably it. Yeah, yeah. so I should just go get it. Just because, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, it would be like very terrible. So, Yeah, so normally we try to load everything on this computer here, but the system didn't work at all today. So um, yeah, we had to improvise it. Hi, uh, I'm Arifin, and I'm a student of Rob Woodbury at the Design Alternatives Lab. Um, so I'm here to talk about the exploration of parallel alternatives in design tasks and what effect it has on task completion. I hypothesize that uh, design tasks will be completed not only faster, but designers will also go through several alternatives, making it more exploratory. Right. So firstly, what do I mean when I say alternatives? Alternatives are basically just uh, versions which you work on. So a design task is uh, an ill-defined problem, and there are many solutions. So you can design a chair in several ways. So that's why uh, you need to go through several alternatives, because you want different options. Um, so designers do that in the early stage by sketching, doodling, and iterating over the design. We need to design interfaces which support these sort of activities. It's important for design. And current user interfaces don't support that very well. So there are two kinds of uh, interfaces. The first, I mean, the one, what I'm going to talk about are subjunctive interfaces. Subjunctive interfaces are those interfaces which actually support the exploration of parallel alternatives. And the other one is the single state document model, which on which you can work on just one at a time. So most of the stuff we work on now, for example, for example, Microsoft Word or Photoshop, they just support one at a time. So we are here to talk about the other one, the subjunctive interfaces. Here's an example of a sub subjunctive interface. So on the left, you have the single state version. These sliders um, help you. Th this is a visualization of an ant's uh, food foraging behavior. And if you manipulate these sliders, you get to see different uh, uh, visualizations. 
On the left, you have a subjunctive version of the same interface. So you can see you can view several alternative scenarios at the same time, and you can have multiple sliders, so you can actually combine and compare. So this is an, an example of a subjunctive interface. So the biggest advantage of having parallel explorations is, in previous studies, it showed that completion times and design tasks are faster. Right. So for those who don't know, a quick intro to fractal trees. Uh, recursive routines present, uh, sorry, recursive routines generate uh, patterns, which are known as fractals, and you can have them like as binary trees. And there are these parameters you can change, and they will ge generate different patterns. So pre in previous studies, there was a, a tree matching task in which there was this interface called juxtapose, which, in which you can, uh, in which you could like have uh, several alternatives at the same time and participants perform much faster with the juxtapose interface than with the single state interface. I'm, trying, I'm here to kind of replicate this experiment with my own interface, which is called explore form. So I have a short video to show you what it does. So you can generate fractal trees, and you can uh, edit parameters, and you can create alternatives. You can link them together and make simultaneous changes. And then you can unlink them, and you can save history snapshots so that you can go back to the different stages in history, right? So we gave participants a tree matching task. You had four sets, sorry, three sets of four trees each, and uh, they had to match them. And the matching criteria was it was subjective, um, so it was a visual inspection. It was more or less the same, with a little bit of here and there. It didn't matter. They could they would tell me when they thought they had matched it or when they will actually gave up because I couldn't have it going on forever. So we had 15 participants and uh, most of them had a design background in some sort of visual design, for example, uh, graphic design or web design or UI. Some were architects and three of them were really experts in this sort of generative or parametric design and uh, all of them were more or less familiar with what fractals were. So. On the left, we have an example of a good match. You can see that it's almost the same. And on the right, you have what I call an average match. So you can see that they're a little off, but we can more or less see the structures are the same, so we know that they were trying to match that tree. So this is uh, both of them were stopping criteria, so I stopped timing them when they got to these stages. right? So what was the outcome? Well, um, the biggest takeaway from this, from, from this was uh, Except one, nobody really used the features to kind of explore alternatives. And uh, some of them thought the enhanced features were intrusive. Some of them ignored them. Some of them didn't discover. And some did discover them, but they were too focused on the current task to kind of actually see what they do. So, But then all of them actually agreed that exploring alternatives was important. And also, the history snapshot was really important. So we did an analysis. Uh, it was a repeated measures ANOVA, and the different features of the interface did not have a significant effect on the time comple uh, task completion times. Then we looked at others. So the sets were designed to be more or less of the equal uh, of equal difficulties, and we and the time the mean time taken per set was also not significantly different from each other. But they did get faster by the task. So by the third task, they were doing they were much faster than the first task. So there was a learning effect. So finally, what conclusions? It does not support my hypothesis that they will get faster and they will explore more alternatives. But there was a need to explore more alternatives. So that still remains. And wh wh what are the areas I could have improved on? So for example, the interface. The interface really needs to be redesigned. People need to be able to discover the features. Secondly, um, we need to kind of prime users as to what they can do with those features so that they can really use them properly. And the third thing was probably the task. The ta matching task is very strictly one-to-one. -one. There's actually no need to explore so many alternatives. So maybe if we change the task a little bit, they will explore alternatives, and then we can run better analysis. And the fourth one, of course, the tree matching, the matching criteria was it was subjective evaluation. There should be a more objective way to evaluate whether trees are matched or not. So maybe if we change these, we will have a we will have more positive results, which say that exploring alternatives will make tasks faster and more exploratory. Thank you. If you have any questions.
So it was um, it was quite varied actually. I had one participant finish in four minutes and one went up till half an hour. So if you can go back to the confidence intervals, you can see that that's quite large, right? Yeah, you have a question. Yeah. Why is it a tree? So we were looking at uh, parametric design and those who don't ac have experience in parametric design, any other task would get really difficult and this is quite simple. I mean, like I said, um, a lot of people, most of them said they've had experience with fractal trees, right? So it was a simple task, right, where you just slide sliders to kind of generate trees and you don't need theory of design or any such experience to kind of generate these. So it was looking at a very simple task set. Yeah. You mentioned that four participants are more familiar with fractal algorithms. Did you see any significant difference? No, there wasn't. That was the whole point. They Even they did not, they were, they behave generally as the, almost the same as the other participant. Surprisingly, the only person who used it for actual parallel explorations where she created several alternatives and she linked them and she went back to several snapshots in history to kind of build up to the final task. She was not an expert. Yeah, right. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Okay. So a few more notes. Also, big thanks to all the presenters. Great job. Um, for many of whom, I think it was the very first experiment in statistical analysis and so on. So I hope this was interesting learning experience and so on. The first one is always the most difficult one. So what's left to do for the students uh, is basically write it up and review it and so on. But uh, I think it's quite promising what we've seen so far. Um, are there any questions about the course or anything in general? that you're interested in. So basically, as part of this uh, quantitative research methods course, uh, I started including actual experiments and so on with real data and so on because it just seems to really ground people a lot better in, in the reality of really doing things. And uh, it's quite different if you do your own experiment, you actually care about the data. It's not just dummy data. So that's why we try to come up with small experiments uh, to run as part of this course. Um, Kate, do you have any? Uh, comments uh, about colloquium and so on? Uh, thanks for all being here. Um, the colloquium is, I'd say, a work in progress each semester. We're trying out different things and we really appreciate having uh, presentations from the class because we see the work of outside academics who are visiting, um, but we also uh, like to know what one another thinks. It's really a sort of cohort building exercise as well, getting to know each other and what you think. So it's really nice. Yeah. And as you see, there's a huge variety of the different topics we do here at CL, which is, uh, so every year I'm totally amazed, yeah. So last year, I think you had the qualitative research methods last presentations. Yes. Uh, so it is, it's incredibly diverse, and we see that when you're visiting faculty members as well. So that's yeah. a challenge and a big opportunity for all of us. Yes, for sure. Uh, so I have one last organizational thing, and that is uh, actual course evaluations, uh, because this is our very last session for the course. So uh, those who are in the uh, 802 course, I'd like to stay, and I need one kind of volunteer.